Hello, watching this video will take 20 minutes of your time and leave you with a bunch of useless information about Breath of the Wild that I've specifically curated for its massively impractical nature. Let's go. Link can carry an impressively unrealistic amount of stuff. When maxed out completely, it breaks down to 19 weapon slots plus one for the Master Sword, 13 bow slots plus one for the Bow of Light, 999 each of regular, fire, ice, electric, bomb, and ancient arrows, 20 shield slots, 5 pages, which is 100 slots, of armor and clothing pieces, 149 natural materials, monster parts, and creatures that can all stack to 999, 3 pages of cooked meals, each dish taking up one slot, which would come to 60, however, some stuff like baked apples, seared steak, seared prime steak, roasted bass, etc. can all stack to 999, which really throws off my figures a little bit. So for the sake of this calculation, let's just assume that all your cooked meals are unstackable. At least five different saddle and bridle sets for your horse, and I am calculating for the base game only, not the DLC by the way. 459 Korok seeds, that's 900 total minus the 441 needed to get your inventory maxed out, not to mention the Sheikah Slate itself, the Paraglider, and I'm not including Spirit Orbs or the Champion abilities because they're kind of part of Link from within, you know what I mean? So essentially, at bare minimum, Link can carry about 155,529 different objects in his pockets at any given time, and 155,530. 30 while fighting Dark Beast after picking up the Bow of Light. After completing your very first shrine, the animation of Link kind of hesitates as he seems a bit unsure. Like, should I do this? Is this what I'm supposed to do? Will I be okay? All the other 119 shrines will have the exact same cutscene of Link touching the glass, breaking it, talking to the monk, but with no hesitation or uncertainty about what to do. And speaking of completing your first shrine, there's a split moment after you do so where you regain control of Link right before the old man starts talking to you again where you can side hop a tiny little fraction of the animation. The boulders that roll down the chute in the stasis shrine never get the chance to fall into the abyss. Instead, they fade out right in front of you if you watch them. This is likely to keep them spawning back at the top of the chute a little bit faster, keeping that cycle a little tighter, and making it a necessity to use stasis your first time running through. There's a couple little spots in this pool of water here next to the Magnesia shrine where you can get bullet time. But doing a wind bomb here is impossible because the bombs float to the surface and completely mess up the bomb placement. There's an open seam along the mountainside south of Hebra Peak and the Goma Saga Shrine and northeast of Hebra Falls that you can kind of explore a little bit inside. There's not really a whole lot to do inside here, it's just kind of a nook that's not supposed to be here, but it is cool and I hear there's a lot of other holes that are unsealed around the map that I'm not yet aware of. If you photograph something where you can see Link's shadow holding the slate, keep that photo and then keep on looking through the camera as if you're about to take another identical shot, you'll suddenly see that Link's shadow is not holding the slate anymore despite it being in the exact same position. And when you go into selfie mode, you can see the Sheikah Slate is still on Link's waist. In creating a champion, it's explained that the eye of the Sheikah Tablet can come out and fly around like a little dragonfly drone. This is apparently how we can take selfie shots with a full 360 degree pan, but it's unclear why this feature was never mentioned in the game itself. If you're in a cold climate without cold protection and while Link is wearing the dark hood, Link doesn't really look worried and concerned as he's freezing, he looks a little more angry. Beetle, specifically, he will respond to being threatened even while he sleeps, but he's the only NPC we currently know who acts this way. And on that note, NPCs only feel threatened by your remote bombs if they're inside the blast radius. I think this is unusual because it implies that they're intimately familiar with the exact blast radius of the remote bombs, so how do they know exactly where the safe zone is if Link is the only person who's able to use them? You'd think that if they were even just outside the blast radius, there would at least be a flinch, but there's no reaction at all. The difference between dubious food and rock hard food is that the latter is created by including non-salt rocks or gems in your dubious recipes. Most people think that there's no getting into Gerudo Town unless Link is wearing the complete feminine Gerudo outfit, but the guards will also accept sand boots or snow boots as an alternative to the Gerudo Sirwal. And not only that, they'll accept the Thunder Helm in place of the Veil. 
When you look through your scope at the pins you've placed around the map, the Sheikah text running up them translates to, it's dangerous to go alone, the direct reference to the old man's famous advice from the very beginning of the original Legend of Zelda. And for some reason, the pins are numbered from 0 through 4 rather than 1 through 5. I have no idea why they would choose to do that. There's this super amusing and extremely easy glitch to pull off called moon jumping, and while there are some useful uses for this glitch, especially when you pair its abilities with those of the travel medallion, moon jumping on its own is just kind of cool and fun to mess around with. While making this video, I was thinking about this a bit, and I thought maybe I was wrong about not being able to throw Kuko into the top of Death Mountain. Maybe Moon Jump is the way to do it. But unfortunately, while Link is Moon Jump glitched, if you hold a Kuko and then try to jump, he just drops it or puts it down. The Omanau Shrine, aka the Magnesis Shrine on the Great Plateau, is an anagram for Aonuma, as in IG Aonuma, Nintendo's lead producer for the Legend of Zelda series since at least the late 90s. The Breath of the Wild development team started humbly, with less than 10 people on the team. The name Breath of the Wild itself is most likely a reference to the exact moment right when Zelda finally realizes her sealing powers as she steps up to protect Link, takes a deep breath, and unleashes her sealing powers for the first time, out there in the wild. There are tons of references to previous Zelda titles. To list a few, Several bridges around the overworld are named after bosses who appeared in the original Legend of Zelda. The Gliok Bridge is named after Gliok, a multi-headed dragon. The Aquame Bridge is named after Aquamentus, a horned dragon. And the Dig Dog Suspension Bridge is named after Dig Dogger, another reoccurring boss who originally appeared in the original. Hyrule Castle's library has two books containing secret recipes. One is for Zelda's favorite dessert, fruitcake, and the second one is from Monster Cake, a cake with two monster horns as decorations on top, which is said to be the favorite of an unnamed Chancellor. This is a reference to Chancellor Cole from Spirit Tracks, who works for the princess but is later discovered to be trying to revive evil. The two top hats that he wears are supposedly covering his demonic horns. Another way developers paid homage to past titles is seen at the Master Sword pedestal where there are three silent princesses around it, two on the left, one on the right. This is how flowers grow around the pedestal in A Link to the Past. The emblem around the Triforce in the Sanctum doesn't just have Zelda's lullaby around it the way I mentioned in the 10 minute video. The entire emblem around the Triforce itself is a reference to the Gate of Time from Skyward Sword. More homage was paid by the developers to Four Swords Adventures with the Malice Eyeball enemies that grow around the Divine Beast and in the castle. These eyeballs seem to be modeled after the boss Vitae's sprite form, a reoccurring boss who first appeared in Four Swords. If you go into your inventory and read the description for Rock Salt, it says crystallized salt from the ancient sea, which is a reference to the Great Sea from Wind Waker. Linebeck Island is named directly after Linebeck, who captains the SS Linebeck steamboat in Phantom Hourglass. And the beautiful Lake Colomo got its name from Lokomo, a tribe in Spirit Tracks. Near Woodland Stable, there's an NPC named Shame who wonders if people used to live in the sky a long time ago and mentions that she'd like to ride a giant bird. She's obviously referencing the land of Skyloft and the mass of bird companions known as Loft Wings from Skyward Sword. And two more significant callbacks to Skyward Sword are right there in your inventory. The first one being the Paraglider, which is just a more advanced version of the Sailcloth, and the second one is a little bit more subtle. It's the Zora set, which allows Link to swim up waterfalls, which was crafted using dragon scales. This is a nod to the water dragon scale Link receives in Skyward Sword, as an item which gives him similar swimming abilities. If you listen really closely to the song Koss is playing at Foothill Stable, you'll hear that he's actually singing a Pona's song from Ocarina of Time. All these different references and nods to previous titles has led to tons of speculation about what story will unfold in Tears of the Kingdom. When you're swimming around without any clothes on, Link has a slightly faster swimming speed. Now if you've ever tried swimming around fully clothed versus skinny dipping in real life, you'll understand the difference is significant. You cannot jump right on top of a cooking pot. The game just absolutely will not let you do it. 
Down in the Sanctum, where the final fight with Calamity Ganon takes place, you'll notice that the walls have a bunch of artwork all around it, and they depict landmarks from around Hyrule. There's Divine Beast, Death Mountain, and a few other things. It's really cool and worth taking a look. Developers wanted to make Link look cool, but not too cool. To do this, they decided on an overall streamlined design, subtly accentuating his muscular physique so he didn't end up too smooth. In addition, they strategically designed how the shadows would appear under his pectorals and given him a hint of abdominal muscle. They also went with a somewhat androgynous look to attract gamers of all kinds to play. Another way to make Link a more neutral character, according to Aijiao Numa himself, was to lose the iconic green tunic and hat for pretty much all of the game, because developers just felt the outfit had become too expected. Interestingly though, nobody on the team came out and said, yo, let's make him blue. While developers drew lots of landscape concepts in the beginning of the development process, Link began wearing blue clothes early on because the blue just stood out against the backgrounds they were drawing. As weather cycles pass during your gameplay, you probably notice stronger or lighter patterns of wind. What's cool is that windmills around Hyrule actually respond to the different wind speeds rather than just being designed to perpetually spin at the same constant speed over and over. Early development played with the idea of introducing musical instruments in the game, a staple in many Zelda games, but not all. Had this aspect been included, Link very well may have been able to play an electric flying V guitar called a Tricaster, likely named after Fender Guitars, Telecaster, or Stratocaster models. There's also notes in creating a champion about Din's drums, Ferrore's bass, and Nehru's keyboards. While you can't actually pet dogs in this game, the idea was initially considered. In fact, developers wanted to give Link a navigator dog companion, and this idea evolved into the Wolf Link spirit being available via the amiibo scans. Princess Zelda has three outfits throughout the game, her main fieldwork outfit for when she's out and about on the go, her ceremonial royal blue formal wear worn mostly inside the castle. And of course, the pure white maiden's outfit she wears during her training and prayer and when she unlocks her sealing powers. Zelda clenches her fist in frustration when her father condemns her for what he interprets to be her not trying hard enough to fulfill her destiny. And then, as a ghost expressing his regret for being so hard on her, King Rome clenches his fist the exact same way. Indicating this is one way the royal family initially deals with anger, frustration, and regret, and on that note, right before the battle between Link and Calamity gets started, Link clenches both fists before the face-off. The way Link clenches his fist though is more of an expression of bravery and preparedness to fight to the death as he stares evil directly in the eye. However, he only does this if you don't have the Master Sword yet. If you already have the Master Sword, he will take that out right at the start no matter what you already have equipped. Developers had this idea that they wanted the game to end out in the middle of the open plains of Hyrule Field, so they needed a big final boss. Enter Dark Beast Ganon, arguably the easiest final fight in any Zelda game. But this man bear pig, made of malice, is also the most giant form of Ganon ever seen in the history of the series. Every NPC in Hitano Village has custom dialogue for if or when you talk to them while holding the blue flame. Also, in the previous video I mentioned how the heat of the blue flame will destroy cryoblocks, but that's not very accurate. It's not so much the heat, it's the unique properties of the blue flame that reacts with Sheikah technology. The blue flame will also instantly detonate your bombs on contact. There was a fifth divine beast originally intended for the base game that resembled a mana ray. You can still find a small replica of what this divine beast would have looked like hanging from the ceiling inside the Hitano ancient tech lab. Exactly why that one got scrapped has yet to be known for absolutely certain, but we can assume it was partially due to deadlines for the development and release date. All Bokoblins and Lionels equipped with a bow and arrow will close one eye while they look down the sights to fire at you. This is great attention to detail as that's what you would do in real life with a bow and arrow. Moblins turn their head to the side and only look through one eye, but they don't close the other one, which I personally kind of found a little bit disappointing to be honest. Not only that, Lizalfos with a bow will not close their eye because their design inspiration comes from chameleons which have monocular vision meaning that they can move each eye independently of one another. But when they've targeted prey, both eyes will lock on for the strike. And besides, Lizelfos couldn't close one eye if they even wanted to, because chameleons don't have eyelids.
and despite the attention to detail that developers paid while having Bokoblins and Luzalfos fire a bow and arrow, I don't believe that it's possible to know for absolute sure whether or not Link closes one of his eyes while firing down the bow because the camera will always flip around to face his back. We can't get a shot of his face to see what he's doing with his eye while he shoots off the bow. And I was going to give the benefit of the doubt and just say, yeah, he probably does. But given the fact that Moblins don't and also looking at this shot of artwork here, which was used, I believe, in the opening trailer for this game, he has both eyes open. So maybe Link doesn't fire the way you're supposed to, but he's still a great marksman. But I still just couldn't leave it at that because I sometimes find myself going down rabbit holes about whether or not Link closes one eye all the way while he's firing off the bow or not. Confirm, Link does not close one eye all the way while he fires off the bow, but he does squint the other one just a little bit. So, you know, uh, the judges will, I'll let him have it. <laughs> If you've never talked to an NPC before, Link has no idea who they are, so their name just won't appear above their head. But once you've introduced, Link will remember their name, and it'll appear above their head every other time you approach them. It's a pretty cool little detail. You can find the Bolson construction logo in several places. Their mark is on signs and doors and Bolson's personal hammer. And most interestingly, even on the sledgehammer that you can use. The Zora blacksmith who can fix some of your weapons, however, uses tools from a different company, the Gorons Tools. His hammer has the same Dodongo footprint logo seen on the tools of all Goron miners. Which is pretty cool because there's a Goron over here hanging out in the shop looking over his shoulder the whole time. But still, if you head to the southern mine at Death Mountain and you go to pick up a hammer over there, right there with all the Goron tools, it'll still have the Bolson construction logo on the hammer. So there's a couple of modifiers for your shield, including guard up and durability up. There is a third one in the game's code that was removed from the actual game called Surf Up, which would have made it so that any shield can surf around, basically second best only to the ancient shield. Would have been pretty fun. We've talked a little bit about all the different ways that Link can open up chests in the different animations in the last two entries of the series, but there's still one more way to open a chest I've completely missed so far. You can open up wooden chests by destroying them, either by blowing them up, hitting them with a weapon, or lighting them on fire and letting them burn until they open. This does not work on metal chests. The locations featured in the title menu are not just concept art, those are places you can go to anytime after you finish the Great Plateau. There's this one where he's climbing up a tall cliff of circular rock to just to the right of Mount Garange and the South Lome Labyrinth facing towards the northeast. There's this iconic shot right here which is located on Satori Mountain facing towards the northeast again. And this third shot right here is found by standing on the northernmost of the two dueling peaks, standing more on the northwest side of it facing northwest. Also, judging by the shadows on this shot, it seems to have been taken around 2.30 p.m. The symbol of the Triforce is everywhere within the game, but the actual Triforce itself did not make an appearance in Breath of the Wild. The closest thing I've seen people count would be the glowing emblem on the back of Zelda's hand as she awakens her powers, or this visual of the Triforce that appears as she's subduing Dark Beast Ganon for the final kill. But that's not the physical Triforce either. That's different from the relic that was formed when the three goddesses pieced out after they created everything, as explained in Ocarina of Time. That's just Zelda connecting with it and owning her embodiment of her share, the wisdom portion. And speaking of the three goddesses and the Triforce, their symbols can be found on the ground in the little rubble remains of the buildings that once stood out in front of the Temple of Time. Din, Nehru, and Furore, one in each building. If you overlay a Triforce on the map where these three symbols lay, it lines up perfectly to have Din's triangle point to the Temple of Time and the empty triangle space pointing directly towards Hyrule Castle. The music that plays inside shrines just kind of works differently with unique randomized phrasing. Basically, every single time you enter a shrine, you're going to hear the song start a little bit differently. There's a candle on the desk in Zelda's little personal study, and if you want, you can light that candle anytime you want. Once you've finished help building Terrytown, you can actually ring the bell that's in the center behind the goddess statue by grabbing it with Magnesis and just swinging it around. However, ringing this bell doesn't really do anything, the NPCs don't seem to care, and if it bothers them, they've been keeping it to themselves. 
So I'm sure you're already aware about diamonds, sapphire, ruby, topaz, all that stuff. But there's one precious stone that you cannot collect that does exist in the Breath of the Wild Hyrule, and that's jade. This green-colored gemstone is seen in all of Rivali's jewelry, but nowhere else on the map at all. If you do a quick Google search for good Switch games, Breath of the Wild should always appear in the top results, and at least one dad out there in the world who doesn't know very much about video games did precisely this to get their kid Breath of the Wild as a birthday present, who then went on to enjoy this game so thoroughly that they watched a YouTube video about it and posted a comment, and then the guy who made that video decided to make a follow-up because he thought it was such a cute little anecdote about Breath of the Wild that was also extremely useless. Go, that's time. If you want to see a 30 minute version of this kind of stuff, like this video to convince me to do it and subscribe to make sure that you catch it when it comes out. And until next time, stay well, stay cool, and always keep punching out there. Aloha.